Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, the book of Galatians, chapter 4. Uh, let's pick it up in verse 12. Let's talk about Paul's infirmity, and then we'll talk about what our infirmity is. All right? And is it, is it okay for born-again, Bible-believing Christians to have something wrong with them? Okay? Whether it's a, a physical affliction whether it is an emotional affliction, whether it is a spiritual affliction. You, do you think you ever get afflicted by very evil, bad spirits? I know I do. Um, is it a sin affliction that Paul had? Let's look and see what the Bible says. Uh, verse, verse 12, chapter 4. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. So, in the ministry, those who are in the ministry and those who are not in any time of full-time ministry where God has set some apart to be evangelists or pastors or teachers or whatever, um, are the people in the ministry supposed to be just like everybody else? The answer is yes. Paul says, be as I am for I am as ye are. Just because somebody, God calls somebody into full-time evangelism, full-time pastorate, uh, to be a full-time teacher or whatever, that doesn't mean that those, those are the ones that God created to be special above everybody else. That they're automatically more spiritual than everybody else is. They are automatically 20% uh, less sinful than everybody else is. And um, God, God obviously has picked those people because they are, in fact, better than other people. That is what some people in ministry may want you to think. That simply because they have a big mouth and they can talk in front of people or they can sing on stage or they can play the piano or whatever, it's almost like we have set those people up or they have set themselves up to be over everybody or better than everybody and us puny people down in the pews who don't have any real talents why we'll just be glad to make it in heaven not like those people I mean those people are guaranteed to be in heaven because they're better than we are right because they're closer to God because they're in the ministry that's not true it's not true God does not call those who are qualified he qualifies those of us whom he calls just because somebody like me, uh, God called me to, to be a pastor. God called me to the ministry when I was 16. But when I look back on my childhood, I could see how God was moving me in that direction. God's calling on my life goes all the way back to the time before Adam. All right. And uh, the, I could see how God was moving and arranging things in my life for me to be who I am, including all the mistakes I've made, all the stupid stuff I've done, all the stupid stuff I've said, all the stupid stuff I've thought, every mistake, every sin, every transgression, every failure in life equals who I am now in Christ. Because how can I teach people about grace except I know what grace is? Not just from reading it in a book, but experiencing it first hand. How can I tell people, how can any of us who are in the ministry tell people about how God lifts people up out of the pit, except we also have been in that pit? Okay. So this idea that those in the ministry or those who are singers on a stage, and I like good gospel music, how can those of us in the ministry pretend that we're any better than anybody else when, in fact, God made us out of the same dirt as he did everybody else and God pulled us out of a pit like he has everybody else in the world. And so this idea that I'm better than somebody because I'm in the ministry, that just doesn't work. God selected the Levite priests and he said they had infirmities. Paul had infirmities. He had weaknesses. He had thorns in his flesh. 
keep that in mind. Let's keep reading. Uh, he said, you know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, he despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul said, when I was there, you knew how bad my eyes were. You knew that I wasn't Mr. Know-it-all and Mr. Hotshot and Mr. Good-looking and Mr. Eloquent Speaker. You knew that, but you accepted me anyway as the messenger of God. You accepted me because you knew that what I was saying was from Jesus and not rolled out of my own head. So he says, verse 15, Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you'd have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. Now keep in mind, Paul is speaking of those who have come in this church or these churches and tried to plant into their idea that it is through keeping the law, it is through circumcision. And remember, the Jews were all about boasting in the law. Look at us, we're the children of Abraham. We are the circumcised elect. And God has obviously chosen us to live by way of the law, and we keep the law, and we thus honor God because we do good things. You get it now? Here comes Paul teaching them there ain't a one of us worthy of the kingdom of God. We're all rotten, dirty, scoundrel, uh, conniving sinners. Uh, we're all so wicked that it's amazing that God even allows us to breathe his air. Here comes Paul teaching that versus the, <clears throat> the esteemed Dr. So-and-so, the esteemed rabbi who is now going to teach us these great profound things from God that none of you stinking people would ever know except it had been from him right? Paul's contrasting his ministry, his weaknesses, infirmities with the doctor know-it-alls who act like they're better than everybody else and everybody's just eating that up. Oh, he is better than all of us. Of course he is. We, would, we wouldn't go to heaven except for him. Believe it or not, that's why, that's why the doctor know-it-all churches are full is that man in his evil nature loves to elevate other men above the, everybody else and follow those people. And in Bible Christianity, it's not so. And I tell you, it's not just the Hebrew roots people that are guilty of this. It is the Christian fundamentalist churches as well. Because the fundamentalist guy, I've been around fundamentalism all my life. And I know that it reeks of legalism. It reeks with the foul stench of Dr. So-and-so has never done anything wrong his entire life. He's never tasted alcohol. He's never looked at another woman. He has been so faithful to God that us puny, the rest of us, it's a marvel that we even get to be in the same room. I have, listen, I've been to those meetings. And I'm sick of them. I don't like to see self-righteousness anywhere because I know it's not true. I know the people who exude that sort of confidence are lying through their teeth. I know it. So, Paul says, am I going to be your enemy because I tell you the truth? And, he, and this phrase here, they would exclude you that you might affect them. In other words, you see, they, they run you out because you're not on their level. Okay. And they want, they want putting you out to elevate their status above everybody else. I've been there. I, listen, I used to participate in it until God weakened me, until God destroyed me, until God crippled me just enough so that I walk as a broken, crippled human being, guilty before God, and I'm thankful for the grace that he's ministered to me. Not arrogantly like I used to be, wonder how come everybody else didn't live right except for me. That was back, that was back in the day. Um, 
But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I'm present with you, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. We're going to talk about that. That's going to be good. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. So Paul's infirmity, he specifically does not come out and say, man, I'm almost blind. I can't hardly see a thing. That's my thorn in the flesh. I think he leaves it open so that those of us who are trying to recognize our own thorn or thorns in the flesh, that we would understand that it's not going to be limited to, I can't see straight. It is going to be how the Bible defines it for each one of us, because your thorn is going to be different than mine, or might be different than mine. And so God calls each one of us to search out in the scriptures, what's wrong with us? Not necessarily what's wrong with you, but what's wrong with me, all right? So he says, 2 Corinthians 12, this is that passage where he talks about his thorn and why he got it. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 5, Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. You see, that is in contradiction and contrast to everything that I know that I thought at a previous time in my life. Before, I never wanted anybody to think that there was anything wrong with me. I used to cover my sin very well, so much so that I never admitted to anybody that I do things wrong. I wanted everybody to think of me way higher than what I really was. I was good at covering things up. I was good at hiding the fact that I was very, very wicked and sinful. I used to cover that up very well with self-righteousness knowledge, knowledge puffeth up, and I used to cover that up so that everybody would think, boy, he's really something, that Mike, okay? And Paul says, I'm going to glory in mine infirmities, not in how good I am, because I'm not. But my infirmities, let me tell you about my infirmities, let me tell you about my thorns, let me tell you what's wrong with Paul. Verse 6, for though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but, I, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Again, don't lay on me this idea that I'm better than you. If I could just touch the hem of Mike Hoggard's coat, well, and some of that great intelligence that he has would just rub off on me. All right, and I've had, I've had, I had a pastor, good, very dear friend of mine, and I don't lie to my friends. That I'm not saying I lie to anybody else either, but with my friends, I'm pretty honest now. And I, I taught some things at a meeting one time, and the pastor was telling me, he said, "Boy, man, people were talking about you last night." And one guy said, "Man, if I just knew a thimble of what Mike Hoggard knows, man, that would be." And I said, "Brother." So let me tell you something. I appreciate that, but there's a thorn that goes with all that knowledge that is far greater than any good that I would ever do. I have the capability of absolutely destroying the entire world single-handedly because that's me. And I said, if you want that kind of knowledge, you've got to be willing to bear the thorn that goes with it because it punctures in pretty deep and it hurts and I have to live with it for the rest of my life okay start being honest about yourself um, so he says verse 7 lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations now let me stop right here the greatest revelation that you'll ever have number one is of course the knowledge of Jesus Christ being the Son of God, King of Kings, the Savior of mankind, the Messiah of the Jews, and He's coming back. The second greatest thing that you'll ever come to realization is what you already know is that this Bible, 100% perfect in everything that it says, and 
the things that are contained in this book, there isn't another book in the world that can touch it as far as what is found in this, in this book right here. If you've ever eaten at what you think is a good restaurant, I guarantee you there's one out there that will just absolutely blow it away. And if you ever ate at that restaurant, you'd never go back to the other one. Okay? Well, that's how we are with this Bible. Because somebody will say, Boy, I tell you what, I like going down here to old Bubba's catfish place. They got some pretty good stuff. And I would say, well, let me tell you something. There's a place here in town. If you've ever been here, you'd never go back to Bubba's a day in your life. I guarantee it. All right? Of course, somebody's going to say, I'm fighting words. Okay, well, let's bring it on. But I'm telling you, if you go here, you'll eat. And it's the same way. People will say, oh, I just love the Hebrew and the Greek. When, I, when my pastor teaches me Hebrew and Greek, I just love that. Let me tell you something. There's things here in this English Bible that'll blow that junk away. You'll never read another Hebrew, you'll never sit on another Hebrew Greek lesson in a sermon when you can start pulling stuff right out of this English Bible. I promise you, you'll never go back. I, I don't study Hebrew and Greek. Maybe every now and then I'll look at something because it interests me. But beyond that, I don't give everybody Hebrew and Greek lessons and say, see, see how good I can pull this stuff out of the Bible, okay? You'll, you'll never do that because you don't know Hebrew and Greek, okay? I give people the English King James Bible and show them that they can read and understand things here that they would never get anywhere else, all right? So, with that knowledge, knowledge puffeth up. And if we're not careful, we'll go around, I've done it, you've done it, puffed up with this knowledge that we have about our King James Bible being right. And one of the accusations from the non-King James only people is that the King James people think that they're all that because of their uh, exalted knowledge that King James Bible is right on everything. They hate our arrogance. And it's justified. Because we can get pretty arrogant and cocky about this little knowledge that we have that our Bible's right. All right? So, with that knowledge that your Bible's right is going to be a thorn that may look like, okay, yes, the Bible's right, and guess how many times you're right? Zero. There's always should be a thorn with our knowledge, with the revelations that God has given us. If you're scanning through this Bible and you hit upon something that just, I mean, the doodads go up and down your back and you just get this elation and you can't wait to tell everybody what you found. And nine times out of ten, it won't make sense to somebody else. But man, I mean, it's, you, it is fantastic. If you ever have something like that happen to you, don't go around being Mr. All That because of what you found in the Bible. You found it because God allowed you to find it. You even believed the Bible because God allowed you to believe the Bible against all the stupid, nasty stuff that you've said and done in your life. So, don't let the knowledge of what you find in the Bible puff you up. There's always going to be a thorn that's going to go and deflate you. That's how it's supposed to be. If we have revelations, rest assured, we're going to get beat up over them. Look at it. Um, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Always going to be a messenger of Satan, an evil angel, a devil, a foul spirit to buffet you, to torture you, to persecute you, to hurt you, always going to be that way. And God's going to allow him to do it. God is going to allow devils to beat you silly sometimes. There's been times where I'll preach a message, and I remember one Sunday in particular. Man, I, the Holy Ghost just moved and God got all in our service, and people were at the altar, and people were saying amen without me asking them to. And the sermon felt good. I mean, it was just flowing out of me. 
And I'm just, I'm preaching. I'm going, where is this coming from? Man, this is good. And no sooner than I got done, I went into my office and I absolutely collect, just, I mean, it hit me just that quick. Pain all through my body. Um, weakness in my flesh just overcame me and I was instantly fatigued. I was in severe pain and I spent the whole afternoon laying on my couch in my office almost unable to move. All right. My wife says, are you okay? Yeah, hon. It's just the devil beating me up. Okay. And she knows me well enough to know that I'm not making that up. She knows it's real in me. And she knows why it happens. Okay? Bless her heart, she'll pray for me. And she has, she has to live with me. But she knows from time to time in order to keep me where I am emotionally and mentally, spiritually, that devils have to really ride me hard and torture me emotionally, torture me physically, torture me spiritually. God will allow, when I start getting a little arrogant, God will allow me to kind of veer off into sin every now and then. You don't believe that? I'm telling you. Let, let me show you this. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Here's, here's something that when I saw it, I went, I know what that means. For this thing, I besought the Lord thrice. Not once, not twice, thrice. Three times. Why three? Why did he pray? Why didn't he pray 16 and a half times? Why didn't God hear him the first time? Why did Paul feel compelled after God didn't answer him the first time to pray it again and then to pray it again? Why three times? What's that number three? Uh, Genesis 3. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You say, well, I don't know. What did God curse the ground with because of Adam's transgression? Thorns. He said, in fact, look at this and apply this now to any of you guys that preach the, preach the gospel or you teach a Sunday school class uh, or you lead a Bible study or you lead your family in Bible study or you make YouTube videos. Okay, Look at what God told Adam. He said, verse 17 of chapter 3, unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. God cursed the ground. Ground didn't do anything wrong. God cursed the ground because of Adam. And us, my ground, my pasture, my vineyard, is my church, my family. Yeah. I have to watch people in my own family go off into sin and do things wrong that when they do it, I just go, I'm not mad at them. I'm mad at me. Because where do they get their sinful nature? Me. When I see my children do or say something that I know is wrong, I know where they got it from. They got it from me and that hurts to know that my children sometimes will have to suffer because of my stupidity. You remember Achan, um, who took the, the stuff from Jericho that he wasn't, he took a, a garment of clothes and he took an idol and he buried it under his house. You remember what happened to him? He had to stand there and watch as the Israelites pelted his wife and children with stones until they died. And then he himself died. He had to watch that. He had to know that his wife and children suffered for his stupidity. So he cursed the ground in sorrow, for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Yes, you're going to have a good family. Yes, you're going to enjoy it every now and then. But then you got to take the thorns along with it. There's great enjoyment in the ministry. But i got to take the thorns and know that the people in my church are cursed because of my transgressions. 
I have to deal with that. I have to live with that. And it's tough sometimes. Okay? So, um, I believe he said it three times to designate to us that sometimes these thorns are going to be sins themselves. Things that Paul does wrong that won't leave him. And he's asked God three times, God, will you please take this sin out of my life? You ever done that? I have people call me on the phone all the time, write me emails, write me letters, say, Pastor, I have a, I have a pretty serious issue. And I, I've asked God to take it away. And there's people that tell me, well, obviously you didn't ask God in faith. or you, Obviously God knew you weren't serious. And I'll say, people really told you that? Yeah. And I believe them. I, I guess they're right because, you know, God's not taking it away from me. So maybe I'm not being truthful with God. Maybe I do really want that sin and don't want to get rid of it. And I always ask them. When you ask God to remove that sin from you, do you really feel like you were being totally honest with God? And they'll say, yeah. Do you really think that God knows that, yes, there's a part of you that wants to sin, but there's another part of you that absolutely doesn't want to do another thing wrong in your life and you want it gone? Yeah. I said, so you really do want your sins and your transgressions gone, don't you? Yeah then why won't God take them away? I mean, if we ask God to take our sins away, does God then turn around and say, well, I'm waiting. Whenever you quit, then I'll take it away. Well, that is contrary to what you asked God to, be, to begin with, right? Because if you could have quit sinning yourself, you would have done it already. You would have just said, you know what? I'm sick of this. I'm done. Um, my dad, when he was young, 19, 20 years old, he smoked cigarettes and he enjoyed them and he had no idea of quitting whatsoever, but he came down with pneumonia really bad and he went to the doctor and the doctor told him, he said, uh, big youngin, that's what they called him, youngin, you're going to be dead in six months if you don't quit that smoking. You know what my dad did? Quit smoking right then and there. My father-in-law. My father-in-law used to smoke cigarettes back way in the, you know, back in the 50s and 60s when everybody smoked cigarettes. He smoked them. And he told his wife, yeah, I know my father-in-law, okay? He told, my, he told his wife, he said, uh, Gloria, he said, them cigarettes go up to 25 cents a pack. I ain't going to smoke another one of them. So he come home one day from work, and he went to looking around for his cigarettes. Gloria, where's my cigarettes? She said, you said when they go up to 25 cents a pack that you're going to quit and not to buy you no more. So they went up to 25 cents a pack and I didn't buy you no more. So he had one pack left. And he said, I carried that in my shirt pocket for six months. He said, because for me, the hardest habit to break is every now and then you slap your pocket. And you stop working, you slap your pocket, pull the cigarette out. So he carried that box around for a long time just to have it. But from that day forward, he never smoked another cigarette. But that's not everybody, is it? My mom, she struggled with them. Fell in our church, Brother Jimmy Carmichael's now going on to be with the Lord. He struggled with them. And he knew that he couldn't quit by himself. And he begged God to take them from him. And one day, God finally did. Now, there are some people, however, that I know haven't quit to this day. And they want to so bad. And they've asked God, God, take them away from me. And so far, nothing. So, does that mean that they really didn't want it? No. Because let me show you this. This spoke to me. This, God helped, God saved my life with this. Because I needed it. So he said, for this thing, verse 8, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Paul realized he couldn't take it away himself. So he's asking God three times, God, take this away from me. Not you know, one after another. God, take it away. God, take it away. God, take it away. I said it three times. Now what? It wasn't some magical spell that he was chanting with God. He prays it to God. He waits a while. Maybe a day, maybe a week goes by. Next time, do it again. 
So he prays to God again. God, please take this away from me. Okay? Maybe a week and a half goes by. Next time, boom, there it is. Do it again. Ask God the third time to take it away. And I have this little thing that I tell people. If you're a child, if you're really a child of God, that means you're sealed with the Holy Ghost, okay? And you are going to heaven, no doubt about it, if you're a son of God, right? I mean, you're not a bastard, are you? God hasn't just cast you away as nothing has he? No, you are saved by God's grace, and God's going to keep you to keep that which you've committed unto him against that day. God's going to do that, all right? And I tell people, if you're really a child of God, God never tells you no. He never tells you no. When you look in here, did God say, you read this, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, and it might depart from me, and God said unto me, no. That's not what he said. <clears throat> God will either give you exactly what you asked for, or he'll give you better than what you asked for. Now, which do you want? Do you want exactly what you asked for, or do you want better than what you asked for? I'm always wanting better. So, and he said unto me, verse 9, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So, Paul, I won't take this thorn away from you. What I'll do is that I will just give you grace to cover it. Grace to bear it. Grace to live with it. Grace to that will carry you through until this body is gone and you receive the new body. And of course, that new body, you'll never want to sin again. You'll never want, there will never be another thorn in you, Paul. So which is it? You want me to take it away? Or do you want me to give you something better than taking it away? I'll give you grace. And you decide which you think would be better. Because does not God know better than we do? Is not God able to discern what our real needs were? Doesn't the Holy Ghost pray for us better because of our infirmities than what we pray ourselves? We don't even know what to ask for. I mean, here's Paul saying, God, take this away, right? And God said, Paul, I've got a better plan. I'll leave that thorn in you because that'll keep you down where you need to be. And I promise you, my grace will cover you every time that thorn is present. So when God showed me that, he said, Mike, this is why I've not taken your sins and transgressions completely away. I mean, my life now is better, way better than it used to be. But I still have my moments. And with every new thing that God shows me out of the word, Every new number pattern, every new typology understanding, every, every verse that just jumps out and I say, I know what that is, I know what that means, I'm going to tell everybody on PMO tomorrow. With every one of those, God uses the thorn in my flesh to remind me, Mike, you're still human, you're still flesh and blood, you're still so unworthy of everything that I've ever given you. Mike, here's your thorn. Now, you can't be all cocky and arrogant over everybody, and how come they don't know that? They must not read their Bible like I read the Bible, and I've heard so much of that, it just makes me puke, because I know whoever tells me that is lying. I think it's better to be honest before God and before people and let God cover you with grace. Grace to bear the thorns. Grace to bear the infirmities. Okay? So he said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. One, two, three, four, five things here. You know what the Bible says the fifth time Noah's name is mentioned? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Husbands, 
You want to be strong for your families, right? You want to be strong for your wife? Let God be strong and you be the weak one. It's better that way. Ladies, you want to be strong for your children and strong in the face of adversity? Then let Christ be strong in you and you be the weak one. I'm just telling you, it works this way. When you start hearing from the Christians about how good they are and about how they don't do this anymore and they don't do that any well, I never do that, I tell you that right now. When you start hearing it, when you start hearing that from preachers, the hardest thing for me to endure is 50 minutes of a preacher preaching about themselves and about how good they are and about how smarter how much smarter they are than the rest of everybody else and about how smarter they are than the liberals and how better they are than the than the perverts of this world when i hear that i know that i'm enduring 50 minutes of pure lies cuz the guy who will speak of himself highly the most is probably the worst of us and he's doing what adam and eve did He's making aprons out of fig leaves to cover himself. And God won't accept it. He'll never accept it. Uh, turn to Psalm 77. By the way, Psalm 77, that number five, is just kind of, I, God reminded me of something here. I know something that you don't know, and I'm not going to tell you because I'm better than you are. You're not worthy to have it. No, that's not true, is it? Psalm 77 is the 555th chapter of the Bible. Okay? That's just a little piece of information I know. Psalm 77, verse 6. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart. You know what that means? I physically talk to myself. I do. When I'm all alone... I'll just, I'll talk and talk, and, and it's real embarrassing when somebody comes up and says, who are you talking to? Nobody. Okay? I do. I commune with myself. I chat with myself, sometimes out loud. Best way to end the day is communing in your heart with God. You and God talking. And we always, we do this, right? We'll be in bed, we'll be laying down, and we're praying, and then we go to sleep. <laughs> God, I'm sorry for going to sleep, right? Okay? I mean, you can still be sorry for going to sleep, but God gets it. You're in bed, right? You're laying your head on your pillow. you got your eyes closed. Of course you're going to go to sleep. And what better way to go to sleep than talking to Jesus? I mean, there's scores of other things we could have on our mind when we're going to bed, right? Think Bible. Think Jesus. Best way to end the day. So I commune with my own heart, and my spirit made diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Is God done forgiving you? I mean, you reached the line, right? You, you crossed the line of, God, I know I keep confessing the same sins over and over again, but God, I need your forgiveness. I need your mercy. God, will you help me? Right? You ever been there? I have. And you say, God, is your mercy clean gone forever? I mean, because I heard the preacher say that if I sin and I say I'm sorry and then I go out and do it again, I'm not really sorry. Really? Because you thought you were sorry. You really felt sorrowful. You really asked God to not let that ever come back on you again. And so you get afraid that God's not going to forgive you anymore for doing the same thing over and over again. Again, if you could have cast off sin on your own, you would have done it already, and you wouldn't need Jesus. But the truth of it is, we're not going to make it except Jesus make the way for us. Okay? I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Men like to come up with stuff like that, make it sound spiritual. But it's not right. Uh, doth his promise fail forevermore? You've read those good promises out of the Bible, and you said, well, they're not for me because I've done bad things. Well, you're the one they're for. 
Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah. Think about that. You know, I've never counted this. Uh, will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Six things here. I have to ponder that, what it means. But he said, and I said, this is my infirmity. But I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember the wonders, thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God is our God. Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. See that word strength? That's what Paul was saying here in uh, 2 Corinthians 12. It's not ever going to be about what I was able to stop doing or start doing. It is always, till the day I die, going to be about how God carried me through. So, when you start running these questions in your mind, is God going to cast me off? Is, this, is God done forgiving me? Uh, is, is God's promises for everybody else except me because I'm not a good person? When you think that, think Bible and start remembering. How many times did God forgive Israel? And even though God has cast her off now, he's going to restore her and bring her back to life again. If God did it for Israel, he did it for you. How many times? sins did Paul commit that, Christ, that God had to forgive him of? Um, how many times did Peter disobey the Lord Jesus and yet God forgave him? Um, and you can just start running through the Bible of all, the, all these great heroes of the faith we call them, great people in the Bible, and start looking at what kind of sinner they really were. You'll remember that they're not any better than you are and if God did it for them he'll do it for you okay um, Matthew chapter 8 verse 16 this is what the Bible says our Savior does for us when the even was come they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils and he cast out the spirits with his word I love that and healed all that were sick that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Let's go to Isaiah 53. Uh, this is Isaiah 53 is all about the things that Jesus did on the cross. Um, about a thousand years before Jesus actually came. Uh, or maybe it's about 600, something like that. But anyway... Isaiah 53, 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He was wounded for our transgressions. How many? All of them. He was bruised for our iniquities. How many iniquities? Every single one of them. That's the kind of God that we serve. A God who understands that our righteousness will never suffice. So he doesn't demand our righteousness. He already has Christ who was sin free. And by faith we accept the robe of his righteousness covering us. Covering our infirmities. Um, let's go to Romans. There's plenty in the book of Romans about this. Romans 6.19 I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. And this idea of infirmities, he's speaking of sins. Not necessarily like today, 
uh, it's springtime, and so this time of year, my sinuses are all swollen, and you know I get the sniffles, and I cough, and my eyes get real red. Not talking about that kind of infirmity. Not talking about some disease that you have. The infirmity of sin in you. That now that we're saved, instead of us yielding our life over to infirmities and giving ourselves to them and say, I don't want to quit anymore. We understand that without Christ we're nothing and it's by His strength that gives us the desire to say, I want to be clean. I want to be whole. I want God to take this away from me. And so God will either take your sins away, and sometimes He does, or He will give you grace but you're done yielding yourself over to all these things and say, you know what? I'm tired of Christianity. I'm going to follow God now. Or I'm going to follow my sin now and just give myself over to him. Those days are over with. God has given you a new nature to desire to be clean. Um, ooh, Romans 8. Turn there. That's a, that is an awesome place where these faith healers and these word faith witchcraft people they don't seem to like Romans chapter 8 for some reason Romans 8 uh, let's see here let's pick it up in verse 22 for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together until now and not only they but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit to wit means to understand it this way, wit and wisdom, they go together. Uh, when someone is witty, that means they're very quick to think about uh, smart sayings, all right? Humor, if you're going to have good humor, you got to be pretty sharp, all right? That's, that's where we get the word. Anyway, to wit means to understand, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Well, why would we want a new body? If everything in this body was okie dokie, it's not, and it never will be. And as I grow older, and my, my body becomes weaker and weaker and weaker, my spirit grows stronger, it's renewed, the inner man is renewed every day, the Bible says, and I have more desire now than ever to depart from this world and be at peace with Jesus. Verse 24, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? So if God took away from you every sin and you never, ever, ever want, had the nature to sin ever again and you lived absolutely perfect, for the rest of your life, why would you want to go to heaven? In other words, there's nothing there that we don't already have here. So Joel Osteen sells to everybody now, you can have your best life right now. If you have that, why would you want to go to heaven? I don't want to die, I've got it all here. But we don't have it all here. And we're not going to. And so, we're always going to be in need. We're always going to have infirmities. We're always going to have our weaknesses. And it's going to get much worse as time goes on. And every day, I desire more and more and more to be in heaven with Jesus, away from the wickedness of this world and away from my own wickedness. I have more desire. I have more hope now than I ever have because I want out of this world. It's not all that, it's not good. So he says, we're saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Verse 25, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. And again, infirmities can be, you know, sicknesses, maladies of the flesh, you know, you have a disease, you have some sort of sickness or whatever, it can be that. But let's not exclude 
the infirmities of sin along with it. Because the Bible's clearly laid that out, that that's part of it. So, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. So what if you don't say the prayer right? So what if you don't spell it out exactly, verbatim, word for word, to the letter, what you demand God to do? Because that's what the faith healers and the word faith people are going to tell you. They're going to tell you that, oh, you don't have your million dollars yet? Obviously, you're not saying it in faith. Obviously, you're not saying the right words. Obviously, you're holding back from God, and that's why God won't give it to you. No, the truth of it is, we don't know exactly what to pray. We don't know what to ask for. I've had times where, and God knew me, where part of me wanted to pray, and the other part of me refused. How do you win a war like that? I mean, I wanted to reach out to God. I wanted to call unto God. I wanted to pray. But there was part of me that said, you're not praying nothing. Not going to do it. So I would simply say to God, Father, help. I mean, I'm so distraught, I can't even pr pray. I don't even know what to say. I can't think of the words. So God, will you just, will you help me? Again, we don't demand of our little babies that they spell out to us exactly how much milk they want, exactly what temperature it's to be, exactly when they're going to want the next one, exactly how and when to change their diaper. They don't, we don't wait for them to say, I need to spell it out now or I can't do it. It's ridiculous. To think that God is waiting for us to say the right words and to spell out exactly what we, we want him to do. He's God. If he doesn't know what we need or what we want, then what is he doing being God? He's the one who knows better than anybody what we want or what we need, when we need it, how much of it we need, and so on and so on and so on. God is, the one who, God is the one who knows how much money we're going to need to pay our next bill. God knows it. So this idea that they're telling you that you have to spell it out for God, you have to name it exactly what you want God to do, that's just nothing more than witchcraft is what it is. Um, likewise, the Spirit also will help with our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. We don't know that. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, you're going to hear them say to you, well, that's your prayer language. That's the tongue. You, the reason why you don't have the riches and the healing is that you don't speak it in tongues. Because right here, it says that we, we do this in groanings that Spirit helpeth us with groanings that cannot be uttered. That's your prayer language. You've got to speak that prayer language. Hold on a second. If the Bible says that it cannot be uttered, why then should we think that we need to utter it, even if it's in a prayer language? Why would we think that? The Bible itself says that it cannot be uttered. So that means simply... I can't even say what needs to be said. The Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So what God has established here is the absolute fact that not now nor will you ever in this life be able to pray what is necessary to pray. You'll never be able to do it. That's why the Spirit is there to help us. Because we can't do it. How much money would it cost if we were to pay for our own sins with our own money? How much would it cost? You see, we don't even know the answer to that one. Um, I got a ticket one time. got a speeding ticket. And it was, um, I 
honestly thought the speed zone that I was in was at least 45, 50 miles an hour. And I was doing about 60, okay? I honestly thought that that's how, and I was in a hurry, okay? I was trying to get around traffic, and I took this little side road out of town, and they got me, okay? And I honestly thought that I was in at least a 50 mile an hour zone. Come to find out, it was a 35 mile an hour zone. And I went, oh no! So he wrote me the ticket, and I had it in my hand. And so the next day, I called the city courthouse, and I said, yeah, I just want to go ahead and, and pay this ticket. They said, sir, you don't understand. You can't pay that ticket. You have to go before a judge. What? Yes, sir. The speed that you were doing in the speed zone that you were in, the law does not allow you to just pay the ticket and go on your merry way. You have to go appear before a judge in our city courthouse. Well, that was a smack in the face because I thought I'd just pay the ticket and be done with it. Oh, no. I had to go to court over it. And that's a whole other story. And God gave me grace. And God taught me a lot of things about court rules and how heaven works and everything like that. And I'm not going to spend time, but it was one of those things where I couldn't pay it. They weren't going to let me. The rules don't allow you to pay it. And so even if you had all the money in the world, who would Jeff Bezos? 85 some odd billion dollars. Billion with a B. Richest man in the universe. No one has ever been as wealthy as Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon.com. Okay? Not even he can pay for his own sins. It requires an absolute, pure, unspotted sacrifice. And there isn't one to be found anywhere except Christ. So it's one of those, the realms of impossibilities. So, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, making intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans 15, 1. I'm almost done. Romans 15, 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, not ridicule them, not um, become arrogant over them and say, well, we're strong. How come you're not? We have it all. We're sin free. How come you're not sin free? No, because whatever you might be strong in, somebody else is weak in. But whatever they might be strong in, I guarantee you, you're weak in that area. That's what my wife and I found out about our relationship together. The areas and the issues that she is weak in are easy for me. But the areas that I'm weak in and don't do very well, she's very strong in. And instead of me singling out all my weak, wife's weaknesses and say, you know what, I could do much better with a wife, okay, with somebody else other than her, because I'm just, I just don't understand why she thinks this way and has this weakness. Then I forget my own weaknesses, my own frailties. And God shows me that my wife is there in my life to be strong for me where I'm not very strong. Okay? We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Um, Galatians. Here's a, here's a, you want to talk about something that looks like a, a discrepancy in the Bible? If you look in Galatians 6, verse 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. But then if you look down in verse 5, For every man shall bear his own burden. Well, which is it? Do we bear our own burden? Or do we bear one another's burdens? The answer is yes. Do them both. There are things that we can carry. We should carry them. There are things that we cannot carry. Thank God that there's somebody out there that can. You see what it's saying here? So, 
instead of us looking down on everybody around us like they're terrible people, they're awful sinners, why am I surrounding myself with people like that? I'm much better than that. You're just better off recognizing that you're not better than that. And just because they have a weakness here, you have a weakness there. And their weakness is no better or worse than your weakness. It's just better for us to gather ourselves together. That's why God establishes the church and not just us trying to make it on our own because we don't do so well with that. We bear one another's burdens. We're there for people. We recognize that their strengths and our strengths are different. Likewise, our weaknesses and their weaknesses are different. Their infirmities and our infirmities. And yet, God helps us along every day. Amen? Um, one more. Hebrews 4.15 For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's why Christ came down here to live these 33 and a half years in our skin. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to suffer the loss of someone who died. He knows what it's like to be tempted with sin. But even though Christ succeeded where we failed, that doesn't... Christ is not going, well, I did it. How come you can't, huh? Why can't you be like me? That's not Christ. Christ says, listen, I know what that's like. I know how it feels to be tempted. I was 40 days with nothing to eat, and here's the devil saying, hey, turn these stones to bread. Jesus says, I love you because I know what you're going through, and I'll carry what it is that you cannot carry, okay? That's why we have a Savior. This is why we have churches. This is why we have brothers and sisters to help us along in our life and for us to help them, not cast them away. All right? Um, Paul's going to have a baby. Paul's going to have a baby. We'll study that next time we gather together. Christ being formed in us. You think about that, all right? God bless you. I love you. It's good to be with you today. You pray for us. We'll pray for you. You are the reason why we do what we do. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.